Hello, everyone. Uh, if I sound stuffed up, it's because I am. I am sick of winter. I am sick of cold weather. I'm ready for it to be spring. And yeah. Anyways, the TLDR version of this video is I'm sick of WWE because I don't like the way that Bruce Pritchard, Nick Khan, Vince McMahon, John Laurinaitis, and all of them are running the product and, you know, cutting all these people due to budget cuts, despite that their quarterly earnings have been pretty, they've been increasing, like they've been making profit, they've been making bank, yet they're cutting people due to budget cuts, and you also got the situation with Mustafa Ali, where he wanted his release, because, yeah, they screwed him over with the whole, uh, what are they called, retribution, making him the leader, and like, there were people that I talked to on, like, forums and shit, and they were like, well, maybe this will bring, bring some validity to Retribution. I'm like, no, the fuck it's not. I'm like, why would they drag Ali into that shit? And, as expected, it went nowhere. They disbanded that group. Like, I don't even think that group lasted a year. That group was so stupid. I don't even know who, who whoever idea that was, that was stupid. But this one, I'm just going to shoot from the hip. I don't, like, I can make a script or some bullet points to hit on, but we'd be here all fucking day. Ugh, damn it. So, you know, you have, like, like Lars Sullivan. Ah, eh, I could not care less about him. Steve Cutler, I don't... Was he the other guy? No, he wasn't. Big Show, again, like, he's... He's kind of been there. He's been there, done that. It's like his time in the show is pretty much over anyway. So him getting the boot, not not too big of a deal. And I think Big Show didn't he want his release? It was Show's frustrations with the company. No, okay, he was frustrated with the company. Like a lot of these people were. Andrade is somebody they really fucked over because he had potential to be in that top mid card tier, uh, possibly main eventer. Um, but yeah, they just fucked him over. They just fucked it up with him. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through this list. There's only five pages. Um, Mark Carano, the Senior Director of Talent Relations. I don't know much about him. Um, yeah, Samoa Joe, they released him in April, brought him back, and then released him again. Which I thought was so fucking weird. Like, what was the point? Uh, Billy Kay and Peyton Royce, the... Uh, Performance-wise, I didn't really care, but their um, Iconics antics and all that shit, that was good. I was like, okay, you might not be the best performers in my opinion, but you know how to carry your characters around. And those two piggybacked off each other so fucking well, and they got rid of them because budget cuts. Ooh. And then, of course, you had Mickey James show up at the Women's Royal Rumble. Uh, she's the Impact Women's Champion, I think. Which, you know, I, I like seeing that. Impact and WWE working in tandem together. Now that's that's a good thing. I mean, that's definitely something that maybe gravitate a little more towards at least paying attention to what's going on at the Royal Rumble. But the way they treated Mickey James, like sending all of her stuff in a trash bag, seriously? Like, you're a professional multi-million dollar company. And that's the best you could do? Jesus. <laughs> And, I mean, she's still bothered to show up, but, hey, she got to make the bank. So, um, she didn't stick to her guns or whatever, but, you know, you got you to gotta, you gotta make money. Uh, Chelsea Green, uh, didn't really see much of her. I know she was on NXT for a hot minute, and then she made it to the main roster, and then, yeah, <laughs> that was it. Uh, I believe Kalisto wanted out. Um, Tucker, yeah, they broke up, uh, what are they called, Heavy Machinery. It was him and Otis. And they turned him heel for some reason, and then that went absolutely fucking nowhere. Um, Bo Dallas, I'm surprised, lasted as long as he did, because they were not doing a damn thing with him. And I know I was kind of hoping they would bring him into working with his brother Bray Wyatt, who is somebody I'm going to touch on very heavily, because that was actually what drove me away from WWE, is how they treated fucking Bray Wyatt. Uh, Wesley Blake, you see Jackson Riker, he was another one who got released, but... I, actually, he's an I'm surprised that lasts as long as he did with all that bullshit going on with him. Uh, Velveteen Dream, was he the one? Yeah, preying on grooming minors. Yeah, yeah and then that, that whole thing, I don't know if it's true or not. I haven't looked into the details. If he, um, you know, actually did, and it does say allegedly. But if it's true, then yeah, fuck him. If not, well, they just wrote a man's career based on hearsay. 
Alexander Wolf, I believe he was part of, yeah, he was part of Sanity, which is a faction I thought was going to take off running. You know, I thought they were going to be a big deal, at least for the like tag team division or the mid card division. But you see what they're doing with Nikki. They got her as like it's super Nikki Ash or whatever. Like, no, what have you done? <laughs> Jessamine Duke, yeah, because like they could have had her work with, um, uh, well, yeah, Shayna ba- Basler and uh, Ronda Rousey. You could have had like a three woman, like a heel team of badasses, but no, we didn't get that. But that's the born. I don't know much about her. Same thing with Brandy Lauren. Uh, I think I've seen her a couple of times. Kavita, Kavita Devi. Uh, that's how you say that name. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing it. Um, Ezra Judge, don't know much about him, but he looks built as shit. Uh, Jake Clemens, he was a referee, another referee. Yeah, because it wasn't just performers they were releasing, it was referees, um, talent management. There were all kinds of people that were cutting left, right, center. I think it was up to 200 people overall. Gillian Dane, he was another member of uh, Sanity. Fandango. Yeah, and yeah, you know, you remember Fandango, like, he wrestled Chris Jericho at WrestleMania, and I was thinking, like, this guy could be another upper mid-card possible main eventer. Like, not a long-term main eventer, mind you, but he could, you know, hang around and create, you know, like, if you have a six-man match or, you know, a Fatal 4-Way or something like that, you could put him in there, because Fandango could move. The guy had a good skill set. Tyler Breeze is another one I thought would be good for the upper mid-card, like an Intercontinental or United States Champion. Um, Arya Davari, he was in the cruiserweight division. I didn't follow the cruiserweight division that much, especially after they, was, who did Neville lose the cruiserweight title to that, that, uh, New Yorker guy that debuted with Carmella and, um, the big tall guy that apparently didn't get along with people backstage. I forget his fucking name, but he looked like a douchebag. Now, I don't know if all the allegations and shit against him had any, uh, merit to them, but. Again, like, similar to Velveteen Dream. If there's no merit to them, then they ruined a guy's career based on hearsay. But, um, yeah, I don't remember the guy's name, but, yeah, when they had him drop, when they had Neville drop the Cruiserweight title to that guy, I was like, seriously? Of all people, that's who Neville loses to? And then Neville got frustrated with the company. He dipped the fuck out. I don't blame him. I, I believe he's currently on AEW. Um, Tony Nese, um, I saw bits and bobs of him. And, yeah, like, I, I thought he was going to be, like, you know, an upper mid-card guy. Um, Ever Rise, is that just a tag team? Team 3.0, yeah. Yeah, they didn't have a long sales. I don't think I remember them. Don't remember him either. August Gray, not familiar. The Bollywood Boys. The Singh Brothers, yeah. I was going to say, like, aren't those the Singh Brothers? Because they were with, um... Ah, what's his face? Um... Uh, what the, uh... Jinder Mahal. Yeah, they were like his cronies and shit. Ugh. Damn it, I am stuffy as hell. Um, don't know much about Marina. Don't know much about Kurt. Tino. Braun Strowman, I mean, that dude was a big deal for the better part. Like, what, when did he debut? Like, 2015? Thereabouts. And he's been making headlines. He's been a big deal. He's been doing all kinds of awesome shit. And yet they released them anyway. Ugh. I apologize for my stuffiness. Um, I probably should have cleaned my sinuses before starting this video, but we'll press on and make do. I don't plan on rambling too terribly long. But yeah, they, you know. Oh, he signed with them in uh, 2013. Made his he took the, the single through 2016. So yeah, he debuted in 2015 because it was him and the Wyatt family. Um which they never, I mean, the, the first run of the Wyatt family, I felt like they kind of got it right. But then they broke him up, brought him back together, broke him up, brought him back together. They kept doing that back and forth. I'm like, what are you doing with these people? Um, Eric Rowan was kind of the, I don't want to say the weak link, but he was the least, um, he was the he was the, the, we, the weakest of the four in terms of performance and presence and whatnot. Like Luke Harper was fantastic. His singles run was great. Bray Wyatt's singles run, um, mixed results, but I thought his presence was fantastic. Same with Braun Strowman. And with Eric Rowan, I think he, he worked like as that enforcer type. Like he, when they paired him with Daniel Bryan, that worked. That was good for him. It was good for Daniel Bryan. It was good for both of them as a whole. But 
Yeah, uh, Eric Rowan, I, I just felt like he was kind of in the shadow of the other three. Like, that's no disrespect towards him or anything. I'm not trying to say he's a bad performer. I'm just saying he's the the least best of four fantastic performers, if you will. And I'm not trying to sugarcoat that. I'm being sincere in how I describe these things. Uh, Alistair Black. Now, Alistair Black was somebody, like, his entrance is awesome. His moveset is fantastic. Like, this dude is main event material. You could put this guy in a headline WrestleMania match. Uh, maybe not the main main event, but definitely like a um, a marquee match. Like a match that you're trying to sell. You just got to build this guy up so that way people know who he is. And they fucked it up, as they did with so many other people in this list. They fucked it up, and because of the, the, the amount of talent they've squandered and wasted and didn't utilize... That's kind of why I'm done with the fucking product, at least for now. I don't know if I'm permanently done with WWE, but I'm definitely taking a fucking hiatus until some management changes occur because the way the state of the company right now, it's we'll get into that after I clear this list. Um, Ruby Riot, um, I didn't think much of her as a performer, but I did like the Riot Squad. I like the concept of it. Um, you know, a nice female heel uh, group. And, you know, and, and you had them debut alongside uh, Paige, uh, Sonya Deville, and then uh, what's that other chick's name? She had like the whole Viking get up going, and then they released her. Oh, Sarah Logan. Yeah. I believe it was those three were one group. And then you had Ruby Riot, Mandy Rose, and Liv Morgan. Wait, no. What's, what's, I, might, I might be confusing it. I, I remember Paige and the Riot Squad debuting and. Or well, Paige returning and then the Ruby, the Riot Squad debuting. Oh yeah, it says right there. Oh yeah, so Liv Morgan and Sarah Logan. Okay, so um, Sonya Deville and Mandy Rose were with um, Paige. So yeah, you had those two factions debut. And unfortunately, Paige got injured, you know, by that uh, that accident involving Sasha Banks, which I firmly believe it was accidental on Sasha Banks' part. Was she reckless? Sure. But I don't think she meant to do that. I don't think she was out to ruin Paige's career intentionally. And there's speculation that Paige might come back. I mean, there's been a lot of performers that have told that, yeah, like, you're never going to wrestle again, and they come back. Edge came back. Daniel Bryan came back. We just say Paige can't come back. They just have to, you know, of course, play carefully because you don't want to get paralyzed, you know. That's the important thing is the health and safety of the performers. Like, do we do we want Paige to come back? Yes. Do we want her to risk injury in order to come back? No. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's the it's how risky are you making things for yourself when you come back from an injury, a career ending injury. Um, but so far, Edge has made it work. Um, Daniel Bryan's definitely making it work. He's over in AEW making a killing over there. Uh, yeah, Murphy, um, I they were kind of building him up and then they just said, yeah, no, nah. <laughs> get rid of him. Lana, I mean, once Rusev was gone, I think her. Getting the boot was kind of a foregone conclusion. And, you know, like, Rusev was... I didn't care much for him at first. I thought, like, yeah, he's he'll be here for a year or two, and then WWE's going to fucking forget about him. But, no, he actually hung around, and he was he was there for some big events. And then WWE said, yeah, you know, they had the Rusev Day thing going, and they kept booking him as a heel, even though he was clearly over as a face. And it's like, okay, natural progression says you got to turn Rusev face. Have him turn on, um, what was his name, Aiden English. You know, to have him turn on him or turn Aiden English face as well. And you could have, and Rus- I mean, Rusev Day was over with people. Like, people were behind Rusev. Turn the guy face. <laughs> and instead they kept booking him as a heel. And then they, they're doing the same damn thing with Becky Lynch. Like, I believe it was her idea to, like, return as a heel, but it's not working. She's overselling it, or and she looks ridiculous, and it's just not working for me. Like, Becky Lynch works best as, like, that badass um, tweener, if you will. Like, she's not the baby face, the underdog, or anything like that. She is an ass kicker. That's how she should be booked. That's how she should be portrayed. Not as this fucking, like, full of hot air, arrogant, uh, wearing fur coats and that kind of shit. Like, you know, give Charlotte Flair her shtick back because that's the Charlotte Flair kind of thing. I don't know what they're doing with Becky Lynch. And, you know, in 2018, I was head over heels for her. You know, her Royal Rumble win, the WrestleMania win, despite the botch at the end there. 
Um, you know, she got to main event WrestleMania. I think that was the first female main event in a WrestleMania, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And her reign was, for the most part, pretty good. And the way it ended, I thought, was really good. You know, she announced that she was pregnant, and they uh, gave the uh, it was the SmackDown Women's title to... Or no, it was the Raw Women's title. It was one of the titles. Anyway, they gave it to Asuka, and, you know, Becky Lynch announced that she's pregnant, so she's taking nine months off. Or, well, actually took off more than nine months, but, you know, of course you got to take more than nine months because it's not like, okay, baby's out. All right, I'm good to go. No, you, know, you, still gotta, you still got some recovery time to go. Plus, you got to nurse the baby and all that other stuff, get its medications if it needs medica- med- medications. What the fuck? So there's a whole bunch of medical shit you got to do even after, like, you've given birth and you're out checked out of the hospital and all that jazz. And Asuka's reign, I, I don't really remember it, but then again, that's kind of... That was around, it was around that time where I kind of stopped following... I don't, well, not stopped following the product, but stopped being interested in it. But granted, at that time, it wasn't that I was losing interest as a whole in the same way that I've lost interest now. It was um, it's just the way things were going. I was just like, eh. Eh. <laughs> uh, Tony Storm, yeah. I, I don't know what the fuck they were doing with the pie thing, with Charlotte Flair. Like, that was bizarre. Uh, Jeff Hardy, from what I understand, he was in a dark place and the dude needed some, needs to get his shit together. And if that, if that was like the consensus that he and WWE came to, then good on both of them because your health comes before anything else. And if, you know, you're doing things to yourself that are not helpful or, or if they are hurtful to you, then yeah, get the help you need and then. We can talk about, you know, your return. But although I think now Matt's, Matt, his brother, is trying to get him to sign over to AEW, which, okay, I mean, you know, it, I want Jeff to do what's best for Jeff. If it means signing with AEW, good for him. If it means going back to WWE, again, good for him. Uh, but, yeah, you know, take care of yourself. And then, yeah, you got a bunch of other names. You're like John Morrison. They brought him back, and look what happened with that. Absolutely fucking nothing. Um Karrion Cross, who I thought was going to be a big deal, and, you know, him and Scarlett, like, they had that fucking awesome entrance, they had a great dynamic between the two, and they pissed that away for reasons. Eva Marie and Nia Jax, um, Eva Marie, I don't know why they brought her back, I don't think anybody was clamoring for an Eva Marie return, Nia Jax is somebody I wanted to get better. I wanted her to improve, but she never took responsibility for the numerous injuries she caused. She didn't take the steps to improve her in-ring ability. That way she wasn't, you know, an injury-inducing prone um, asshole, for lack of a better term. She didn't, you know, improve herself. So her being released, I'm like, you know what? Good. <laughs> Let's, we don't need her injuring people who clearly put in the work to, you know, make that bread as opposed to her, who just doesn't take responsibility for all the injuries she's caused. Um, Keith Lee and Mia Yim. But more specifically, Keith Lee. I thought Keith Lee was bound for, like, greatness. Like, the dude was what, he was the NXT and the uh, the mid-card NXT champion at the same time. Um, and they were pushing him to the moon, and then they released him. And, you know, WWE, uh, and now I can get into the this topic I was going to bring up earlier, and that is their inability to br- develop new rising stars. Since 2016, who has risen to prominence? Like, okay, 2016, we had, you know, the the, the women's revolution, Becky Lynch, Charlotte Flair, um, Bailey, and Sasha Banks. They, they, were, they were the future of the women's division. And they carried it, and now you need to also have a bit of a changing of the guard. Like, of course, those four are still going to carry the uh, the women's roster forward, but they're they're your headliners. They're they're the ones that you need to um, you given them the torch. Now you need to find people to give the tor- for them to give the torch to, like your Bianca Belairs, your Mia Yims, your Ember Moons. And instead, you just release all this talent, and it's like, okay, well, you're good for the short term, but where, what's your long term plan? Who are you going to have around? You, R- Ronda Rousey, she's not going to be there forever. Brock Lesnar, I, I grant you, Brock Lesnar's obviously not a female performer, but you keep bringing back these old names like John Cena, Brock Lesnar, Oldberg, and it's like you, these guys are getting old. Like Oldberg's probably got, I think he's only got one more match in his contract with WWE, and then he's done. And that dude should have retired like decades ago. Well, not decades ago, but he should have retired like a good five years ago. 
Because the dude's just not the same as he used to be. The dude's, what, pushing 50, almost 60 now? And John Cena, he's... I mean, yeah, he's still got a, a bit left in the tank, but his main run's over. Like, you'll bring him for special events, by all means, but he's not going to be there 24-7 to carry your product forward. And sure, you've got, you know, Roman Reigns doing his thing, but I'm not going to lie. I'm actually starting to get bored of him, and I was being patient as shit with this Travel Chief thing. But he's been champion for, what, almost two years now? Like, a year and a half? And presumably he's going to drop the title of Brock Lesnar, of all people, or... Bobby, or I don't know, Bobby Lashley's the current WWE champion, which I don't know what they're doing with Lashley and the Hurt Locker, or Hurt Locker, the Hurt Business. And, you know, you've got Ronda Rousey, or you've got Charlotte Flair and Becky Lynch as your two women's champions. And Becky, the Becky Lynch heel thing's just not doing it for me. It, to me, it just doesn't work. Um, Charlotte Flair, I'm beyond sick of Charlotte Flair. I think she's a spoiled brat. I don't like. I not, I'm not talking about the character. I'm talking about the the actual uh, person herself. Is that she comes off as a spoiled brat, entitled to everything, and they keep giving her like this faux, like she's a multi-time champion. But yeah, she's held the she each of her reigns was like maybe a month or less. It's like yeah, you've won the title 15 times, but that also means you've lost it 14 times. So it's like that's not really something to brag about, and it's so it's artificial as fuck as well. Like you can see what they're trying to do. They're trying to make her into a female Ric Flair. She is living in the shadow of her father, whether she wants to admit it or not, and that's because WWE can only market her based on her surname, not her actual performance in the ring. Now, do I wish that would change? Yes. Do I believe Charlotte could change for the better? Also, yes. I want her to. I don't want her to be the spoiled, entitled uh, brat. I want her to put over talent to help carry the product forward. You know, you can have your time to shine. That's fine and dandy. And by all means, you know, if you earn it, then by all means, you should bask in it, revel in it. But at the same time, they're putting her above everybody else. And they're kind of doing the same thing with Becky Lynch now. And it's just kind of like, I'm like, I'm turned off to Becky Lynch, which, you know, if if you would have told my 2018 self that, you know, yeah, two years from now, you're not going to like Becky Lynch anymore or as much as you used to. I'd have been like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Like the way she's going, she's gonna, she's like the fucking baby face of the damn company right now. Like she's the one that fans are 100% behind and they're still fucking behind her, even though they've decided to turn her heel, whether that was her decision or creative's decision. They, her heel run has been terrible. It's just been fucking terrible. Uh, who else we got here? Uh, Grand Metallic, I believe, wanted his release. Oh, Harry Smith. <laughs> now, this one's funny. Dude didn't even get any screen time. They brought him back and signed him, had him sign a contract, and he never debuted. They just released him. Uh, it's just, <laughs> why bring him back in the first place? A waste of his time and a waste of your time and a waste of everybody else's fucking time. Oh, and a waste of money. Um, I don't even know if he had that 30-day no-compete clause. Because there, there were a lot of these people they brought up to the main roster just to release them. So they had that 90-day no non-compete clause instead of the 30-day one that they would have if they were in NXT. Which is some really scummy shit. Like, why? Why would you do that to people? And, you know, if you're releasing them after negotiating these new contracts, like they did with uh, BFAB. Because I believe she got, like, a new contract for, like, two or three years or something like that. And they brought her to the main roster with uh, Hit Row. And then they released her because I guess Creative felt that Hit Row didn't need her. And then they released Hit Row. And it's like, what are you doing? What's going on here? It's so stupid. Oh, who else we got? One Lorcan. I think I've seen a couple of his matches. Yeah, was, and then you, know, you got Bobby Fish. Um, yeah, like they've lost, what, three out of four members of the Undisputed Era? Um, and then Johnny Gargano's gone. Uh, who knows how long Ch- uh, Ciampa's going to be there. Because, yeah, they have the NXT 2.0, which nobody's liking. Nobody's enjoying that. Um, yeah, and then Bray Wyatt, like, that's that's a big one as well. That was actually the pretty much the final nail in the coffin. Everything else was just added added fuel to the fire. You know, and this was back in August. And you know, then you had all these releases in November. Um, December, and then so far we haven't had any new releases as of this year, but let's see, the first quarter so that'd be December, so yeah, March we might, Mar- but like po- probably post WrestleMania, we might see some more releases, but when I look at the product as it is now, 
Like, it can float. It still has the ability to float. Just float, though. That's it. Um, but where does it go from here? Because a lot of these talents that you have sitting on top, you know, your Bobby Lashley is like 40 years old. He's not going to be there for 10 plus years. Roman Reigns, he'll be there for a while. Sure. But even he's going to like, eventually you got to have a change of the guard. Um, uh, Becky Lynch and Charlotte Flair. Again, the Becky Lynch thing as a heel, not working for me. They need to turn her into a tweener at best. Like, I can make peace with her being a tweener where she just fucks everybody up, be they face or heel. She just fucks everybody up. Granted, the concept of face and heel has kind of dissolved into the nothing since um, kayfabe just doesn't exist anymore. But that's that was kind of a natural thing that was going to happen with the rise of social media and how these uh, performers engage with the audience. So it's I can't really fault WWE for not being able to distinguish between face and heel, aside from when they book people like, you know, like the Rusevs, um, and whatnot that are clearly over, you know, Rusev was over with Rusev Day, and it's like, okay, he clearly the fans want to cheer for him, so let's turn him face. Have him fight against heels that people want to boo, like, you know, your Jinder Mahals. Um, but no, they, they don't know what they're doing, and they think of the short term, and that's what I think the problem with this company is, is they're thinking short term. They don't have any long-term plan, and this is actually a similar problem with these AAA gaming companies, as they release unfinished products because they need to make their quarterly earning statements to their investors. So they say, look, guys, you made all the money. And it's like, yeah, you made all your money, but now people want refunds. And, you know, you look at how Battlefield 2042 is doing, and it's not a, it's a sad state of affairs. And it's like, you're a multi-million dollar company. How the fuck did you screw this up as bad as you did? How did you manage this when you've got these indie developers releasing, you know, they're not, you know, AAA quality games, although, Triple A as quality is <laughs> kind of losing its um its uh its tick. Like when you say Triple A gaming, you, you kind of associate it with unfinished product with live services. Um, but you know you've got all these indie companies producing games that are fun, enjoyable, and whatnot. And you know every now and again EA hits it out of the park. Like I bought the uh, remastered Command and Conquer, which includes the original Tiberian Dawn and Red Alert. I'm enjoying it. Like. The graphics update, I know it's nothing groundbreaking, but it looks polished. It looks nice. It plays well. Uh, there's a couple of graphical errors, but or graphical glitches, excuse me. And then the uh, victory screen doesn't show you how many guys and buildings and whatnot you destroyed and lost, but that's a minor detail. Um, but yeah, with like WWE and AEW, I was hoping with AEW becoming as prominent and big as it was, even in spite of the pettiness from performers over there like CM Punk and all of them. And you know, I understand they were frustrated with WWE and frustrated with Vince and Nick Khan and Bruce Pritchard and all of them. Understandable. Completely understand that. And, you know, to get your your uh, verbal jabs in against WWE because of how frustrated and pissed off you are at the company and how you were treated, I get it. I get it. Granted, when you do it over and over again, it's like, okay, we get it. You're frustrated with the company. Guess what? Everybody's frustrated with this company. And um, as JD from New York, I don't know if any of you watch him on YouTube, he put it perfectly in saying that, like, this company's a piece of shit. It's run by assholes that don't give a fuck about their employees. And the way they just release all these people due to quote-unquote budget cuts, yeah, I'm inclined to believe that they don't give a shit. I don't know what Vince's long-term plan is, if he even fucking has one. But the booking has been terrible. The releases have been bullshit. You know, budget cuts my ass. There is something else going on here. I don't know if Vince is trying to sell the company or if he just has finally lost what little sanity he had left. And he's just listening to Bruce Pritchard and Nick Khan, like, spew shit into his fucking head or whatever. But, yeah, I mean, okay, I, I said I was going to ramble for too long, but I've gone on for almost 30 minutes. But, I mean, that should tell you just how, like, disgruntled and detached from this company I am. And, I mean, I might give AEW a shot. I've watched snippets of their matches on uh, YouTube They because they upload snippets and clips and whatnot. And sometimes they upload full matches for people to demo and be like, hey, this is our product. you want to, you know, maybe tune in and watch our show? And I, I might. I don't know, but I'm kind of disgruntled and disjo- disjointed. I'm just disgruntled with wrestling as a whole right now. You know, with um, I'm actually curious as how the fuck 12 2K22 is gonna uh come out because I'm sure 2K is over there like 
I mean, all these releases, like they're rendering all these performers and whatnot, like your Braun Strowman to Bray Wyatt and all that jazz. And then they release them, and then 2 gets like, you know, the, the John Travolta meme where he's just like, where the fuck am I? Where, where's everybody at? What's going on? So I'm, I don't know how they're going to do that. Um, I guess if I had to touch on one final thing is um, Bray Wyatt. Like I said, that was what really just set, that's what drove me completely away from WWE. I was like, okay, you know what? You're getting rid of Bray Wyatt. You're losing me as a fan. You are definitely losing me as a fan. And everything that happened after his release was just icing on the cake for me making that decision to just say, I'm done. I'll follow the stuff on Cage Side Seeds. I'll watch JD from New York and these other people that you know like to rant and rave about WWE. And don't get me wrong, watching these guys go off on WWE is infinitely more entertaining than the product itself. So if the product teaches to suck, I know I'll get some good rants from these guys. Um, OTR Central is another good one, and I've followed him for shit. I think, I, yeah, I think he still had, like, a group of people he did videos with before he just kind of went and did his own solo back. Like, I've been following him for years. Um, he's good content. Uh, <laughs> uh, his Jeff Jarrett rants, some of the funniest shit I've seen. But, yeah, I've gotten into some other ones, like JD from New York. Uh, he he He's a little bit of an egotist, but he definitely – he I definitely get the vibe that I'm like, yeah, you sound like you're full of yourself, but I definitely don't think you're full of shit. Um, you got an ego, but that ego has a place to exist because you've made all these predictions and they've come true. And yeah, I mean, I retroactively watched some of his stuff and he predicted a lot of things that in the end it did in fact happen. It's like, huh, well, how about that? The dude's like fucking the second coming of Nostradamus. Um, or at least when it comes to WWE, he's, you know, Nostradamus of the 21st century. But yeah, I recommend you check out JD from New York and OTR Central if you're into like, you know, watching people rant about the state of affairs with WWE or, um, and, and it's not to say that they're biased against WWE because they've, they've called out AEW when they miss the mark and they screw up. And that's, that's how, you know, that's how I know that they're all being, um, they have integrity in the things that they're saying. They're like not saying it for the sake of saying that they're not clickbaiting people. They're, they're actually informed in everything that they're explaining to their audience that they're chatting to. Now, granted, I think OTRS has a bit of a bias against AEW. But I, I at least understand his perspective. Like, I, I don't think he's out there to shit on AEW for the sake of shitting on AEW. I just think he's a little... It, it gives me the vibes that he's just... He, he thinks that AEW gets more praise than it deserves. And I can't speak to that because, again, I've only seen snippets and bits and bobs of AEW's performance stuff. Um, you know, I might check it out. It just depends. But I've got other shit I'm dealing with. Uh, job hunting and finances and all this other crap. So, you know, WWE and wrestling in general can be in the back burner for however long it needs to be in the back burner. Like, it's not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere, so I can get to it when I get to it. But, yeah, um, this was a long-winded video, longer than I meant for it to be. But, yeah, um, I'm done with WWE as a whole for now. Like, until something changes, until they can figure out how to make a good long-term plan, I'm done. I just, I have, if, if WWE doesn't care, then why should the performers care? If the performers don't care, then why should I care? Why should I invest my time into enjoying these characters and these performers if WWE is just going to either release them or creatively bankrupt their characters like they did with Bray Wyatt, who, by the way, was like their number one seller of merchandise. Like that dude was making them bank and... All you had to do was let him do his thing. But no, creative had to stick their notes in, much like how, you know, movie production studios stick their notes into the um, art, 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 artistic um, nature of, uh, you know, film producers and whatnot. Like, you know, the first one that comes to mind is uh, Sam Raimi Spider-Man 3, where Sony, like, kind of got up in his shit and was trying to stir the pot with him by saying, oh, no, we want Venom, even though, I believe Raimi just wanted um, Sandman. Like that's he, he just wanted Sandman, and that's it. Um, but you know, it is what it is with that, and that's that's where like you know there was an article they released. It was like WWE releases Bray Wyatt due to disagreements with creative, and like he had backstage problems. And it's like, well, yeah, because you you should let this guy just give him the ball, let him run with it, because clearly he knew what the fuck he was doing. And then Creative has to jump in and do all this other shit. And the booking with The Fiend. Oh, my God. The booking was terrible. Like, that Hell in a Cell match with Seth Rollins. Like, even Seth Rollins thought that was bullshit. Like, who... 
what what drove you to to make the call to have the Fiend debut, challenge Seth Rollins for the Universal Title, wins, and you know they had to do damage control, but they had him go at Seth Rollins, beat the shit out of him, and then Seth just starts beating the shit out of the Fiend. They're like, stuff to match, stuff to match. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? I remember how mad some of my friends were with that. They were like, what in the fuck was that finish? Literally, everybody and their mother was like, what in the fuck was that finish? Like, Seth Rollins thought it was stupid. Bray Wyatt thought it was stupid. Everybody and their mother thought it was stupid. It's like, who booked that shit? Because whoever booked that should be fired. Holy hell. And then they had to do damage control at the, it was a crown jewel or whatever, where they had, like, you know, Bray Wyatt go over Seth Rollins. He beat him. It was a great match and all that stuff. But it's like, yeah, I mean, it's great and all, but you should have done that the first time, don't you think, there, buddy? But... You know, it's like, okay, yeah, you of course corrected, but you kind of did the thing you, you should have done in the first place, and we wouldn't be in this fiasco. But anyways, I've rambled on for almost 40 minutes, so I'm going to go ahead and cut it off here. But you you all, I'm sure to get where I'm coming from. I'm frustrated with this company. I'm frustrated with how they're treating their performers, and I'm frustrated with the lack of vision that this company seems to have. Um, at least with AEW, I could kind of at least get a little bit of a concept of their vision because they've got a lot of great talent. Uh, hopefully it doesn't overinflate itself to where you have conflict of egos, but we shall see. But anyways, I've been Devil Watts, and I'll see you all for whatever video I upload next. Where did my cursor go? Here, sir. There you are. Fucker was hiding from me. <laughs>